no, that never occurred to you? I'm not having you. any woman of mine as work. You know you're going no, to get into trouble need, if no, you go down there. Need, no, I won't, no, they don't need to work. You are joking, No, you? I'm not. As soon as your audience, which will clap apparently anything, is frivolous. Um, no, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying... My own opinion is enough for me, and I claim the right to have it defended against any consensus, any majority, anywhere, any place, any time. And anyone who disagrees with this... In this video, we are going to watch the late, great Christopher Hitchens completely rip apart the ideas of wokeness, censorship, and political correctness. I'm going to show you guys a few of my favourite Hitchens clips that culminate in the last one that is just so incredibly powerful. And don't forget these clips are way before wokeness started to really sink its claws into our culture and our institutions. And Hitchens is sometimes held up as somewhat of an icon by the woke left. And this is because of his Marxism and atheism. However, on my list of reasons why I admire him so much, those don't feature. He was an incredible writer and speaker, an amazingly charismatic guy, and a true intellectual renegade, which is something that I'm naturally attracted to. And also a man that went to the places that he spoke about and wrote about and immersed himself in those cultures. He actually got boots on the ground and went to some of the most amazing places on earth. So his writing and his work goes way beyond the atheism and the Marxism. He was completely different to the woke intellectuals of today who would not have lasted five minutes in his world. So let's check out the first clip where he actually predicts college victim culture all the way back in 1994. Um, what I remember was violently resisting all of us in different ways, the idea that the university could be in loco parentis, as it wanted to call itself, the university would play the role of your, right. of your parents. parents. And if you had a beef against another student of any kind, um, it was considered kind of babyish to want to go to the dean the entire time and complain about your feelings. But now it seems to me that not just on sexual matters, but on quite a lot of other things lumped under the heading of correctitude, everyone in the university seems to want to have more authority over themselves, mm -hmm. to be, have more complaints procedures, to have more therapy and more litigation. And I would say, for heaven's sake, there's enough of all that mm -hmm. in the wider society as it is. And you can't justify this by reference to microorganisms, I'm sorry to say. It's not, not viruses that are making people behave this way. It's a, it's a regression to infantilism that's mm -hmm. going on. And I think it's a real shame. Crying no, shame. No, right. So mo morally, I thought right. she made that point we excellently in, the, in her book. The moon and beating their chest and sweat lodges. But that's not a that's But yeah, but just wait just wait a few seconds. That that's the next thing that's gonna happen. Well we infantilizing the infantilizing I was talking about is gonna happen. Men will say, Well, if women can go to the dean if they feel they've been felt up or whatever, I'm gonna start complaining too. Everyone's gonna start being we have a Men will want Men will yeah. want to share in the in the victimhood yeah. business. The, it will be unstoppable and completely negative. It's I, I it's think very that, boring. Does the victim mm -hmm. business is that what I mean? Which, How this? correct was he about this? I mean, who would have thought that we'd be sitting here nearly thirty years later with individuals who are technically described as men due to their age and reproductive organs and chromosomal makeup getting triggered over microaggressions? Microaggressions. Ah, ah. Wanting to shout from the mountaintops about their hurt feelings and find any way possible that they can become a part of the victim club. That was one of the more prophetic things that he said. Now onto the next clip where he's talking on an Australian TV show. And this is one of my favorites of all time because not only is he absolutely amazing here, it's also a perfect encapsulation of the attitude that many Australians possess towards relationships and the sexes. And just remember guys, that Chris Hitchens is somebody who would probably be referred to as somewhat of a classical feminist. He was there in the 1960s during the sexual revolution and all of that. He studied feminist literature and talks about it extensively and has been a champion for the causes over the years. But most men are pretty hopeless when newborn bundles arrive and they're they're so incredibly impressed by how women appear to know what to do and then they think well i'll go off and do extra work and make some money and they justify it in that way christopher i've heard you say this yeah um and well, now i'm saying you're hearing me say it again no but my point would be that i think after the 70s that is actually not true that may have been true but i don't think that is true that men are so less capable of dealing with children and that it's better that they go off, go off and earn money you know maybe the Mother what? could go and earn some money. Did no. that never occur to you? I'm not having you? any woman of mine go to work. <laughs> you know you're going no, to get into trouble need, if no, you go down there. Need, no, I won't. No, they don't need to work. They can, they can if they like, but they don't have to. You are joking. Aren't no, you? I'm not. <laughs> no, I would expect. Oh, to tell take, me, you're I would joking. expect to take care of them. They work if you want, but you don't have to. You are the commander's son, aren't yeah. you? Yes. I am, yes. You, you really mean that? Sure. 
You don't think women should go and work? Yeah, I said they're welcome to do that. I'm thrilled if they want to. But if they don't want to, they don't have to. Is this that's you being I'm, ironic? Is this your for. famous attachment to irony? No. What's so, what's so difficult about it? Guys, if you enjoy this format of video, a little bit different though it is, then hit that like button so that I can get a good gauge of it. Leave me a comment, let me know your thoughts. And also, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, what are you waiting for? Back to the clips. It's just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's just absolutely wrong. No, they're called the gentle sex for a good reason. I want to see them, I want to see them coarsened in the... In the <laughs> Coarsened in the labour market? No, no, not if, not if they don't want to. They You're shouldn't feel they. They shouldn't feel they have to. No, that's not good. I'm here to. I'm here to look after them. But no one got Christopher, it. I've given you every single chance to opt out of that last. Oh statement. no, no. I mean, I, 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 that's my view. I don't think a, a Mrs. Hitchens should have to work. It's been lovely to have you. Thank you so much. Oh, it's very nice of you to invite me. Please, a huge thank you to the sexist but charming Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> thank you very much. A sexist. He's a sexist because he wants to work hard, provide for his family, and spare his wife the burden of having to go to a nine-to-five job every day so that she can look after the children. But like I said, this is a permeating attitude towards relationships in Australia. If you even dare say that you want to have a traditional relationship where the husband goes and works and provides and the wife stays home and looks after the children, then you need to go back to the 1950s and you are a misogynist. How dare you want your wife to be there for the children rather than writing emails in an office? And that's not an uncommon viewpoint, but my favorite part of that clip is how completely unmoved by her personal attacks he is. Rather, he's just totally stoic, unwavering, and sure of himself and his views. Now for a much shorter clip, but one that is still so relevant. One tells me that I've hurt their feelings. I, I, I say, well, I'm still waiting to hear what your point is. Right. I'm very depressed how in this country you can be told that's offensive, as if those two, st those two words constitute an argument <laughs> or a comment. Not to me, they don't. And I'm not running for anything, so I don't have to pretend to like people when I don't. <laughs> Absolutely 100% correct. And this just goes to show to me that Hitchens, if he was still alive today, would be diametrically opposed to the modern woke left. And those that want to censor speech and the grounds with which they want to do that is because they were offended. Their feelings got hurtied. They've lost the ability to be able to do the thing that Hitchens held in the highest regard. The ability to be able to communicate with your fellow human beings and communicate your ideas in a way that is logical and coherent. And before we get to the last clip, let's have a look at a few more entertaining clips of him telling people exactly where to go and not mincing words. You are telling people get a life. Yeah. Well, in fact, haven't they gotten a life? Well, they've got no choice but to get a life. She's not coming back. We can get on without her, right? It wasn't such a big deal. Um, and many, many people are, are, I think, now also now not afraid to say that she didn't mean that much to them. You are yes. just, you've done what you're talking about. You shouldn't even be in these gardens now. You denigrate Diana and her image. You should not be I shouldn't here. be in these gardens? Who the hell are you? No, because the people... You are look, I think you're about as smart as you image. look. You're about as smart people as you are, look. People are I shouldn't be in these gardens. What? Image. You see what, you see what brain rot, to. you see what brain rot descends you on people. Unbelievable. Hitchens no provoked more than one angry response with his comments. For these people, it was sacrilege, because they come here to Kensington Palace and anywhere else Diana set foot just to be a little closer to her. I mean, that's the root of the problem. Um, who wants a third world war? The Iranian president says that one member state of the United Nations should be wiped physically from the map with all its people. Yeah. He says the United States is a satanic power. Uh, his, his members of his government, named members of his he, government, have been caught, have been caught sponsoring right. death squads. He's lied. He's yeah. lied to the European Union about his nuclear program. But you know that a lot he of... He says he believes the Messiah is about to come back. Who's looking for a war here? So does George Bush, by President the way. Bush has said... Okay. I'm not, that's not facetious. You... That's not facetious. Your audience, which will clap apparently anything, is frivolous. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just saying, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm just saying that... I've, I've, I've been on the John Stewart show, I've been on your show, I've seen you make about five George Bush IQ jokes per night. And there's no one I know who can't do it. You know what I think? This is now the joke that stupid people laugh at. It's a joke that any dumb person can laugh at because they, they think they're, they're smarter, they, they can prove they're smarter than the president. Like the people who make booing and mooing noises in your audience. But... But sometimes it's a...
None of whom, none but, of whom, none of whom are smarter than the president. But sometimes a I cigar is really a cigar. Entertaining as that is, although I wouldn't recommend it on most occasions, it's also quite telling. It says a lot when somebody genuinely isn't afraid to be offensive and says what they want and what they think without pandering to anybody and genuinely doesn't care what people think about them. Christopher Hitchens was in absolutely no rush to cozy up to anybody and to ingratiate himself with the studio audience or the cable news networks. He said what he thought and he meant what he said. And even if I disagree with him about a plethora of things, which I do, I respect a man that is genuine and authentic and thinks for himself. Now onto the last clip, and this is one that we should all burn into our brains. I exempt myself from the speaker's kind offer of protection that was uh, so generously proffered at the opening of this evening. Anyone who wants to say anything abusive about or to me is quite free to do so, and welcome, in fact, at their own risk. <laughs> and, um, but before they do that, they must have taken, as I'm sure we all should, a short refresher course in the classic texts on this matter, which are John Milton's Areopagitica, Areopagitica being the great hill of Athens for discussion and free expression, um, Thomas Paine's introduction to the Age of Reason, and I would say a John Stuart Mill's essay on liberty, in which it is variously said, I'll, I'll, I'll be very daring and summarize all three of these great gentlemen of the great tradition of especially English liberty, um, in one go. What they say is, it's not just the right of the person who speaks to be heard. It is the right of everyone in the audience to listen and to hear. And every time you silence somebody, you make yourself a prisoner of your own action because you deny yourself the right to hear something. In other words, your own right to hear and be exposed is as much involved in all these cases as is the right of the other to voice his or her view. Indeed, as John Stuart Mill said, if all in society were agreed on the truth and beauty and value of one proposition, all except one person, it would be most important, in fact, it would become even more important that that one heretic be heard because we would still benefit from his perhaps outrageous or appalling view. In more modern times, this has been put, I think, best by a personal heroine of mine, Rosa Luxemburg, who said that the freedom of speech is meaningless unless it means the freedom of the person who thinks differently. If everybody in North America is forced to attend at school uh, training in sensitivity on Holocaust awareness and is taught to study the final solution about which nothing was actually done, by this country or North America or the United Kingdom while it was going on, but as, let's say as if in compensation for that, everyone's made to swallow an official and unalterable story of it now, and it's taught as the great moral exemplar, the moral equivalent of the morally lacking elements of the Second World War, the way of stilling our uneasy conscience about that combat. That person doesn't just have a right to speak. That person's right to speak must be given extra protection because what he has to say must have taken him some effort to come up with, might be, might contain a grain of historical truth, um, might in any case give people to think about why do they know what they already think they know? How do I know that I know this except that I've always been taught this and never heard anything else? It's always worth establishing first principles. It's always worth saying, what would you do if you met a Flat Earth Society member? Come to think of it, how can I prove the Earth is round? Am I sure about the theory of evolution? I know it's supposed to be true. Here's someone who says there's no such thing. It's all intelligent design. How sure am I of, of my own views? Don't take refuge in the false security of consensus and the feeling that whatever you think, you're bound to be okay because you're in the safely moral majority. And I can't find a seconder usually when I propose this, but I don't care. I don't need a seconder. My own opinion is enough for me, and I claim the right to have it defended against any consensus, any majority, anywhere, any place, any time. And anyone who disagrees with this can pick a number, get online, and kiss my ass. A few absolute bars there and what a mic drop moment anybody who disagrees with me can get a ticket get in line and kiss my ass but also another quote there that was really really powerful don't take refuge in the false security of consensus oh boy 
didn't that one age well? These were truly profound statements that echo with immense relevance today. We are in a time now where free speech is under full on, all out attack by some very powerful people, and it is terrifying. So all of the woke leftists out there who think that Hitch would have been on your side if he was still around today and that he is some sort of woke martyr, listen to the things that he actually said and ask yourself if you're being truly honest when you try and align yourself with him. Another quote there, it's not just the right of everyone who speaks to be heard, it's the right of everyone in the audience to listen and to hear. Write that one on your mirror and read it over and over again in the morning when you brush your teeth or whatever you need to do until you fully understand the gravity of that axiom and also the consequences if we ignore it. So with that guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Hit the links down below to find me on my other platforms in case I ever get canceled on here. If you want to subscribe to the channel, you can click right here. If you want to watch another video, click right here. Till next time, I'm Jake. This is Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous.